we can have different topologies. A way to interpret these graphs is that each of the nodes or the circles, right, the black circles in this case, correspond to some kind of processing units and the edges in these graphs correspond to the communication links, right? Now, you know, there's obviously a lot of ambiguity here, right? First thing is, uh, these are very generic drawings, right? So it's not very clear whether all of the nodes are identical in terms of functionality or not. Generally, when I'm drawing something like this and I use the same uh, kind of, you know, symbol to indicate all the nodes, it usually means that I am looking at the same kind of functionality. Uh, the second thing is with regard to the edges, right? So are the edges, uh, so I said that the edges are communication links. Does it mean that they are bidirectional? In other words, can I communicate in both directions from left to right as well as right to left? Is the bandwidth the same? Is it full duplex? Meaning that, you know, can I communicate in both directions at the same time, right? And are all the links of the same bandwidth, right? So there are a number of different questions that come up when we are talking about a diagram like this. For now, all I want to do is talk about the concepts, right, metrics and so on. Therefore, we'll assume uniformity, meaning that the nodes are uniform, they are the same type of behavior, the edges have the same bandwidth, they are bidirectional, etc. right, all kinds of simplifying assumptions. Having said that, if one of those assumptions is not valid, right, you need to change that, then you know, you should be able to appropriately take the definitions that we are looking at over here and apply them in those con in other contexts as well. So mesh is probably the simplest kind of architecture that you can think of. A torus improves upon a mesh by reducing the end-to-end -end distances. Hypercubes essentially take in the concept that, you know, you, you are not limited to two dimensions just because you can draw on paper only in two dimensions doesn't mean that your connectivity, logical connectivity has to be two dimensional. In fact, it doesn't even have to be three dimensional. The dimension of connectivity is essentially determined by how many links are there from a given node to other nodes. Okay. I mean, that's oversimplifying a little bit. What is actually meant is that if I say I have a, a four dimensional cube, then I should actually have some kind of a structure where I can think of the vertices of that or the communication nodes as being points in a four dimensional space with the corresponding connectivity that would be the same as what you would see in a four dimensional cube. Okay. So other topologies include a ring, octagon is, I mean, in this particular case, because it has eight nodes, it's called an octagon, but in general, the idea over here is more than anything else, you are simply have these shortcut connections, which basically go across the ring from one side to the other. How do the shortcut connections help? It significantly reduces the number of hops required to get from one end to the other, right? So for example, in the ring, if I wanted to get from zero to four, I would need to go through four hops, right? Whereas over here, I would essentially have one hop, okay? And, uh, uh, if I wanted to go to three, for example, I would basically go like this. I would have three hops. Whereas over here, what I would do is basically go this way and have two hops. So in other words, it can reduce, having these sort of shortcut connections can reduce the total distance between nodes, where distance is counted in the number of hops that a packet has to take when I go from point A to point B. Going across one link from one node to another is considered one hop, okay? That is the way that we basically measure the time required or the uh, distances within a NOC. Terminology is essentially coming directly from the domain of networks in general, computer networks. There again, you know, we usually talk about hops from one router to the next, okay? So a lot of the terminology that you will come across over here, those of you who have done a course on computer networks would be familiar with. Right? There is a concept of routing. There are routers that are responsible for forwarding packets. The packet itself is you know, a block of information that needs to be communicated and so on. Okay. And like I said last time, the crossbar in some ways is the most efficient because it means that I have direct point-to-point -point connectivity between every pair of nodes. 
On the other hand, from an implementation point of view, it is clearly going to be much more difficult than the others because the number of wires that I will need to route will be significantly higher in the case of a crossbar than for the other topologies, right? And it doesn't scale well. Essentially, you know, a ring, if I have n nodes, it has n connections. Even the octagon kind of structure, if I expand it out to n nodes, right, it would basically have two n connections, right? Or some order of n connections at least, whereas a crossbar would basically grow as order of n squared, okay? So now let's look at some metrics, some ways of understanding whether a particular network on chip is good or not. Okay. And the first thing that we want to understand is what are, what do we mean by a bottleneck? Okay. Now what I've drawn over here is not really a network on chip. It refers in general more to an arbitrary bus, a shared bus. Okay. So in other words, this is basically the bus. Each of these are some set of nodes and another set of nodes, right? Communication, uh, computation nodes that need to communicate with each other, okay? And, you know, there are various different kinds of communication combinations possible over here, right? Some node might want to communicate with some other node. And the best scenario is, let's say that one node over here, two wants to communicate with six, okay? It has full use of the bus and it can happily just send the data across the bus over here, right? In fact, one thing that could be done is supposing I wanted to communicate between one and two, right? I could basically have communication over here, one to two and three to four, five to six, seven to eight could potentially be simultaneous. What I mean by potentially simultaneous is that depending on how this thing is implemented, right? If, if it is actually implemented as a shared wire in this way, right? If I'm able to sort of put some kind of latches or flip flops or something of that sort over here in between these, right? And partition out these sections, I would be able to have all of these communication links, one to two, three to four, five to six, seven to eight happening at the same time, right? On the other hand, the blue line, two to six is clearly, you know, I mean, that is, that if, that is the only one that's happening. Once again, it has full access to the bus and it will also have the best throughput. Okay. So actually latency is probably not the correct word. It should probably be the throughput or the bandwidth. Right. What I mean by bandwidth is simply how many bits per second can be transferred. Now, what if I instead have a scenario where one wants to talk to five, two wants to talk to six, three to seven and four to eight. Okay. Now all four of those communications are going through this choke point, right? And the effective bandwidth that I get is completely limited by what is available at that choke point. Okay. Intuitively, you can think of it like this. Let's say that you have a computer network. Right. And, uh, you know, you are sitting at home, you are trying to communicate or uh, download something from Google. I'm sitting here in uh, IIT Madras and I'm trying to download something, let's say from the Yahoo website. Okay. Potentially both of us have this scenario where neither of us is, you know, interfering with the other and the routers in between you and Google and the routers between me and Yahoo are completely independent of each other. That is the first scenario. The second scenario is where both of our data, let's say, needs to go through some link in Bombay. And you know, because Google and Yahoo data centers, let's say they are both in the US, right? And uh, both of our uh, data now needs to go through some kind of a data center in Bombay. In which case, what will end up happening is that both of those, you know, that becomes the bottleneck, right? Whatever that router is capable of handling will be the maximum that can be uh, that. Uh, we, we are ending up essentially sharing that resource. Okay. Now, what happens if I have a crossbar switch, right? And the idea of a crossbar is simply that, well, this is slightly different from the full crossbar that I indicated earlier, right? So this crossbar that I have over here is a sort of full crossbar. The other alternative for a crossbar is to say that I have a set of nodes over here, another set of nodes over here, 
and I have connectivity like this. Okay, and this crossbar is a crossbar switch that is capable of connecting anything on the left hand side to anything on the right hand side. Okay, and it clearly has some degree of complexity inside it that allows it to basically manage multiple, possibly multiple connections at the same time. Okay, so now what will happen if I am dealing with such a scenario over here? I could, for example, have once again, you know, one getting switched to seven, right? At the same time, two getting switched to six, three going to five, four going to eight, right? The colors on the uh, picture essentially show you what is going where, right? Now, that is one scenario that is in some sense the best case scenario, right? That is everything on the left hand side wants to go to a different destination on the right hand side. The crossbar is capable of handling this kind of traffic. But what happens if one, two, three, and four all want to talk to eight? Right? Now this becomes the bottleneck. Right? So it's obvious that this is a problem. I mean, you know, it's not as though a better architecture could have helped over here because ultimately what we are saying is everybody wants to talk to the same destination, right? And that destination is finally going to become the problem. Right? On the other hand, if you do identify something of the sort that everybody wants to take uh, talk to the same destination, in some ways, what you are identifying is that now your problem has become communication limited, right? Maybe eight was actually capable of handling all requests from one, two, three, and four at the same time, right? In terms of computational power, it had enough capability. The problem that's happening is it's not a question of computational power. It's a question of the bandwidth available in the system. Now, a two-dimensional mesh, right, has now introduces some extra possibilities. Okay. Yeah. The kind of thing that we are talking about over here, now what we are saying is look, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight are not directly the node numbers over there. They are essentially sort of distributed around, right, as you can see in this picture, right? So one to nine, there are nine different processing elements all connected out here. Okay. And the best case latency, this picture on the left hand side, shows a scenario where once again, you know, you have sort of completely mutually independent connections. Okay. This second picture that shows worst case latency is showing a scenario where everybody wants to talk to six. Okay. But now this is interesting. What we are saying is six has enough computational power, let us assume. In some ways, it also has enough communication bandwidth, right? Because it has four different links, one from three, one from five, one from seven, and one from nine, right? So all four of those connections are available to six, to get data into six. The problem that is happening in this case is the communication data, which is coming from five, four, and eight in this case, are all trying to pass through this one link which therefore becomes the bottleneck, okay? But what you can do when you have something like a 2D mesh is that you can change the routing, okay? So you can have something which goes like this, something else which comes this way, something which comes this way, and something which comes this way, okay? So there are four different links that come into the destination six. It avoids the worst case, it maximizes the use of the bandwidth that is available at six, right? And therefore you are able to provide enough data to keep six always busy, okay? So this is once again, something new that can be done. It, essentially it has come about because of the network structure that we used, a mesh structure where there are multiple links coming into the system. So in general, how does a crossbar get implemented? It would be you know, something which typically has N inputs and M outputs, right? You would have processing nodes over here and you would have processing nodes over here. Now the inputs and outputs could be the same, right? So this could be P1 over here and it could also be P1 over here, right? In other words, I might have a situation where I can send the data from P1 all the way back to P1, okay? 
question will the logic in all the nodes increase as they need to understand where the data is to be routed uh, yes absolutely but okay uh, you know it, it's slightly different it is not that the logic in the nodes increases right uh, what does increase is that this the crossbar right so this is the switching fabric so the nodes themselves are these processors p1 to pn that are available out here okay and Strictly speaking, I could maintain exactly the same behavior in terms of P1 and PN. Their logic or the complexity does not need to increase because all the complexity has now been absorbed in the switching fabric. Okay, But as far as the overall system is concerned, of course, it has increased because now my switching fabric, rather than just being wires, is something that needs to be able to sort of take, you know, compare some packet tag or some destination against some lookup table which tells it where to send the data okay so clearly that's not going to be as simple as just a wire it's going to have some comparison logic some multiplexing logic and, the, and that's basically what will be needed right and what you could have potentially with a switching fabric like this is that the switching fabric could probably even take care of you know multiple different paths from source to destination We'll get to that when we look at the routing algorithms. Another thing that can be done, right? I mean, so what happens with a crossbar kind of structure like this? The ideal crossbar is that once again, it ends up having order of n square connections that you need to make. Okay, if I want to have all to all connectivity possibility, right? Everything on the left hand side and everything at the bottom row. If that is the case, then basically I need n square such switching points, which will allow me to switch from anywhere to anywhere. Okay. Now, once again, you know, you have the order of n square complexity coming in that we would like to avoid. So what is sometimes done is that there are many different kinds of multi-stage interconnection networks that have been proposed, right? A lot of this theory was developed in the context of telephony. actually not so much networks as in switches, right? So the telephone exchange that we talk about, that's precisely this, right? It implements some kind of a cross bar, right? So let's say that I need to communicate over here, from here to let's say, right? So this is my source, this is my destination. I might be able to send data out here, get the data through to this point, then switch it down over here and then finally take it out at this point. Okay, so depending on what my source and what my destination are, I would have multiple different ways by which I can get the data from the source to the destination. So now that we have looked at different ways by which I can connect these things together, let's try and understand some ways by which, you know, given a switching network, how do we understand its behavior, right? How can we quantify its behavior and, you know, are there metrics that we can think of that would tell us that something is good or bad, okay? And one of the most common or the simplest metric in some sense is something called a node degree, right? And this is exactly the de definition of degree in terms of a graph itself, right? So if I have a graph data structure, right? If I think of each of these things, drawings as a graph data structure, Essentially, what it has is a set of nodes, 0 to 7 in this case, and the edges, right? So in the first case, uh, 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, all of those are edges in this graph. Degree of the node essentially just comes down to what would be the degree, the minimum degree of any node in this graph, okay? In this case, right, we have the uh, situation where over here, this would be degree equal to 3. Right. And this one, on the other hand, would have a degree, which is basically seven. Right. So intuitively, one thing that you can probably make out is that the higher the degree of the graph, the more connected the nodes are. Right. Which in general means that the less time it is going to take in order to get from one place to another or from one node to another. The no when I say time, what I mean is the number of hops. Okay, now what happens if I have a system like this? Or in fact, any kind of a mesh, right? Now, what I have over here is this has 
degree equal to 1. Whereas over here, I have degree equal to 2. Okay. In such a situation, there are different things that I could look at. I could either look at the maximum degree, which gives me the best possible connectivity, right? I could identify which node in the graph has the maximum degree that gives me which is the best, most con uh, heavily connected node in the graph. I could look for minimum degree, which would tell me which is the most poorly connected node in the graph. Or I could look at average degree, which basically tells me, you know, gives me an idea of the average bandwidth that I can expect among the different components in the graph. Okay. Now, the next important metric that is defined over here, right, is something called the bisection bandwidth. Okay. Now, in this case, once again, I'm going to assume that the nodes themselves are bidirectional, right? Uh, but you know, it doesn't matter. Essentially, what we are trying to do is we are trying to find the amount of uh, data that can go in one direction, so to say, right, across the graph. So what I would like to do is, once I, you know, you can see these, once again, the three graphs with the corresponding uh, red lines, which indicate how they have been sliced, right, cut into two parts. Now, the question that I can ask is, what is the total bandwidth that I can get going from, let's say, left to right? Okay, in each of these cases. Okay. Now, what exactly does that mean? It in this case, it would mean one link over here and one link over here. Okay. So I would probably say that the bisection bandwidth over here would be two times B, where B equals bandwidth of a single link. When I say bandwidth, what I mean is something like, you know, 10 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second. However, many bits per second can be pushed across that link. Okay. And in this case, I'm going to look in one direction, basically go from left side to right side and say that the bisection bandwidth that I have is 2B. It's symmetric. So, you know, in the other direction also, I would have 2B. Depending on how you are looking at it, you know, you may also want to think of whether you want to add the two and say that the total bandwidth that you have, the total number of bits per second that can be transferred across this link, right? In general, I mean, you know, it makes sense to think of it, look at it just in one direction and what you have is 2B. Okay? Now, what happens in the case of the octagon, right? Now what I have is, I have this link 7 to 0. I also have this link four to three, right? But in addition to both of those, I also have several other links that can go across at the same time, right? So for example, one of them basically corresponds to this four to zero, right? And I have this five to one, six to two, and seven to three, okay? So I have all of those data can potentially go across this partition at the same time, okay? Which means that the bisection bandwidth in this case basically becomes equal to six times B, okay? So what have I done in this case? Basically what I've done is I have taken a partition of the graph, right? I am assuming of course in this case that when for the second one, the octagon, right? When it has three links, it is potentially capable of communicating on all three links at the same time. Okay, that is an assumption I'm making, but that's essentially the, you know, the assumption that you make in terms of when you're trying to find bisection bandwidth. If it turns out that only one of them can be active at a given time, then for example, the four to zero and seven to three would not be counted, right? But the six to two and five to one, for example, could still be counted because those would still contribute to the bisection bandwidth. Okay, so the bisection bandwidth essentially is trying to measure if I just arbitrarily, I, I, why is this useful? Because essentially what it's trying to say is, supposing I had an application that I could partition across the different nodes, right? Maybe it's a Fourier transform, maybe it's a 5G, uh, you know, software defined radio system. Uh, some of the computations, right? The scrambling, the LTPC encoding, uh, go onto the left side, right? Four, five, six, and seven. 
some of the other things, right? The bit packing, the uh, FFT, the layer mapping, uh, matrix multiplication, all those go on to 0, 1, 2, 3, the right side. Okay. And the question that I'm asking is, as long as I'm doing some computations on the left hand side and I need to push data through to the right hand side, what is the best possible number of bits per second that I can push across? Okay. Um, in this scenario, the way that I've drawn it, assuming that seven can talk to both zero and three at the same time, and four can talk to three as well as zero at the same time, what we end up with is six times B, right? Even if I did not allow that, and I only allowed seven to three, uh, six to two, five to one, and uh, uh, four to zero or something like that, right? I would still get four B as the bisection band. Okay, clearly it is better than the ring Right? because I can transfer a lot more data. In terms of the application, what it means is that I'm doing some computations on the left hand side. I need to get the data through to the right hand side. I will be able to push them across on independent links in this way. Now, obviously, once again, you can see that, you know, the crossbar is going to have an even higher bandwidth. Right. And one way of looking at it would simply be, I mean, how do you even compute it in this case? You can pretty much say that seven can talk to zero, one, two, and three, right? So it basically has four bandwidth, four values over here. Six can also go four. This five can go four, and this would also be four. So I would basically get sixteen p, right? Each node on the left hand side has a direct point-to-point -point connection with the right hand side. It would have four times b as its bandwidth, and the total would be sixteen times b. Okay. So this is basically how clearly what the bisection bandwidth is telling you is that, you know, this is a good way of sort of looking at the maximum cross partition communication that I can end up with. Okay. Now, the way that bisection bandwidth is defined in general is to say that, yes, you want to bisect the graph, right? You want to divide it into two parts, but you also want to do it in such a way that this bandwidth is minimum, right? You bisect so that the bandwidth is minimum. That is, you are being pessimistic. Right? You want to find the worst case. Right? You are assuming the best case in terms of which node can communicate with which other node. Right? That is, all of them have data to send and they are all able to sort of communicate over the links. But you want to divide the graph in such a way that it becomes the worst case. Right? That is to say, is there some particular partition that would be particularly bad in terms of how I could communicate data from one side to the other? Okay. There is the next metric that we can think of is something called the network diameter, right? And diameter essentially what it's telling us is how many hops does it get take to get from one end or from uh, the worst case scenario of getting from one node to another. Okay. So over here, what we have is I have P1 over here and P2 over here, right? I'll need to go through these seven links and then these seven links. Yeah, seven, right. So that I basically end up with 14 hops, right? In order to get from P1 to P2. Okay. So that is the worst case scenario as far as this particular graph is concerned. Now, what if I instead had P1 over here and P2 over here, and I built something called a concentrated mesh, right? And the idea of a concentrated mesh is that P1 essentially directly has a link to this sort of central location out here, right? And from there, it can jump to this and to this, right? So this is basically one, two, three links. And then I can jump here, jump here, and jump here. So that's another three links, okay, for a total of six hops. Okay, so this concentrated mesh, what it's doing is it's sort of trying to create localized clusters where you can basically transfer the data more efficiently from one corner to the other. Okay. You have other ways of creating this, uh, uh, you know, this kind of structure. 
one of the things the butterfly essentially what it's trying to do is to say that in addition to this clustering that you have over here i also have sort of the longer links right so i would basically have something which directly allows me to go through from here to here right and then i can go from here to here which means that i can basically end up with one and one so two hops okay now the good thing is because you did the clustering you have fewer nodes across which to sort of do this all to all connection the problem is the all to all connections are still long wires right and the whole idea of why we were coming up with the network on switch in uh, network on chip in the first place was that we wanted to avoid this kind of long wire because it would have high latency high power consumption and we would probably need to end up inserting repeaters okay so the network diameter by itself is just a nice metric which can be used to find out what uh, how good uh, or how fast you would be able to get from one side to the other 